Hello and welcome to Leaders Room. My name is Kate Sweetman and I'm with ICLIF. I have with me here today, I'm delighted to introduce you to, in fact, Sahar Hashemi. She's a serial entrepreneur. She founded, co-founded um, Coffee Republic in the UK and she runs Skinny Candy. And uh, we're delighted to have her here today because she has a lot to say around starting a company, but even more importantly from our point of view, uh, from the leadership point of view, is innovation. So, Sahar, thank you very much for coming. No, it's a complete pleasure. <laughs> Delighted to have you here. I know this isn't your first trip to KL. Um, what I'd like to ask you about, first of all, before we get into some of your eight lessons around entrepreneur or innovation, is um, how you entered into the field of entrepreneurship, actually. Because I do know that you were a lawyer, and I know that your brother, who's your co-founder, was an investment banker. And, you know, that is a path that's clear. It's actually something that you can easily see what the future is going to be if you work very hard and are successful and yet you left all that and you jumped into this world of entrepreneurship and I'm wondering if you could tell us about how you how you did that um, well it's yes it's an interesting question because I never ever thought I was an entrepreneur um, I was growing up I suppose in the 80s and there was just you know in terms of role models in the UK we had kind of Richard Branson and that was it and he was a bit of a kind of superhuman nature and you just no one could relate to him so I thought well clearly I'm not the entrepreneurial type so when I was choosing my career um, it wasn't even an option in the 80s so you became a kind of lawyer a banker accountant um, and I chose the law and I kind of very much I studied at university I enjoyed it when I joined the law firm I loved doing my training but very quickly I realized that actually once I sort of did my training and actually became a fully fledged lawyer I realized ooh, there's a disconnect here between who I am, what my personality is, and what lawyers need to be. And I realized it sort of didn't suit my personality. And I just remember complaining, thinking, this is not me. But I think in the 80s, very much, it didn't have to be you, what you did. You sort of put your work face on. You didn't have to have that strong connect between who you are and what you do. So I ended up staying in this law firm for five years. And I would have never thought of leaving, because once you get on the path, um, it's difficult to leave it just you have a lot of investment you've got a lot of education absolutely. there's a lot of expectations yeah, around you and there's that brass ring called partnership out there and, and you're working your way up and if you leave you've lost everything you've worked for um, and then sometimes I suppose events happen and um, sometimes I think unfortunately we don't need to we don't make changes that we know we need to unless something kind of drastic happens and what happened to me was um, I, th th we c I come from a close family of four and my dad died very suddenly at a young age and that was in a way the spark that was what I just suddenly it was like a wake-up call thinking look you know I'm doing something I hate every day I go there just for the paycheck and um, surely I just realized also my dad died that actually life is short and you've got to do something you absolutely love doing where you could be you um, and I left this law firm and it was a bit of a leap because I had no idea you know, I was leaving all this behind everything I built most of my kind of life from sort of since I was a teenager um, but it was a leap and I'm happy I took the leap how did you get the insight as to what leap to take because one of the things that we know from our experience we, we we deal with people in corporations all the time and a lot of what we talk about is you know what is your purpose you know who are you inside and I think it's you're making it so, I'd love to know a little bit more about your story about how you know there are many many paths out there you could have said well I'm going to become a kindergarten teacher yeah. or I'm no, going to yes, become a or yeah. we can become a neurosurgeon but you became an entrepreneur and so I'm wondering yes. how that happened okay funny enough when I say leap um, it was a leap literally a leap down a cliff it was not a leap into entrepreneurship wow. it was just leaving and it was just and I actually left and I had no idea what I was going to do and I kept thinking well I'll be an in-house lawyer maybe like that I'll be a bit closer to right. business and so it was just a leap into in a way self-discovery for want of a better word so and I actually yes expert, and, oh, I, in part and I decided to just take some time off I'd never taken sort of any time off kind of through education and work and I went to visit my brother Bobby who was working in New York as an investment banker and um, really that's when I was in New York and I fell in love with skinny lattes but again I fell in love with them who doesn't who exactly yeah. and that was I don't know if you remember New World Coffee had just opened in New York mm -hmm. um, but I fell in love with it again you know I, I was fell in love with it but I came back to my brother and I said gosh I really miss them I can't believe we haven't got these coffee bars as I was going for my job interviews to be an in-house lawyer right, right. and my brother said I can't believe you've said this, this is a great business idea I was like business idea you know I meant why didn't someone else open it for me to go to it. I, I didn't think that was the business idea. 
and there was it. That was the first kind of seed of entrepreneurship because it was something I needed as a customer. Exactly. And I hear, you know, jumping ahead 20 years, one of the that things in your book is, you know, get in the feet of your, get into the shoes of your customer, and that's what's going to give yeah. you the insight. And, and so, so it, and essentially, kind of what I learned on this journey at um, Coffee Republic, being an entrepreneur, is I did something that was very much me. I love tasting things. I love eating things. I'm a real consumer. So I would, it, you know, I ended up connecting myself. Isn't there a big jump between loving to drink coffee and then running an empire? Well, you know, the thing about running an empire is, you know, one step at a time, there's no such thing as running. You do one step at a time, you know, and you just slowly get used to it. And I think what people find daunting, actually, about entrepreneurship is this idea of subtly, you know, no one kind of, you know, no one is born 50 and no one is, you know, you just, it's a step by step, day by day stage. So and it's actually very doable, which is why um, my first book's called Anyone Can Do It, because, you know, I never thought I, I would be like this. Um, and yeah, so, so, so that's, and interestingly, actually, um, on the flight here, I was reading, there's a new book called Creative Confidence by David Kelly and Tom Kelly from IDEO. Oh, yeah. And that was interesting. And there was a whole kind of chapter there about how we used to do stuff because it looked good and that was a thing to do. And, you know, your parents were that. proud and, and now people are just actually have to be much more true to who they are and they don't choose their career because it's the thing to do and it looks good and it's safe because faith doesn't exist I suppose so it's essentially about you know something that actually suits your personality and is you did now was this a break for you when, in terms of your family you said your family is very strong very close and you lost your father did your family um, what was their attitude about work and um, life because I'm relating what you're saying back to what a lot of people would say about the Asian culture um, particularly Chinese Asian culture which is actually you do do what your parents want you to do because that's the filial piety thing and uh, your parents know better and so and they're trying to look out for you they're trying to keep you safe and so they try to help you uh, create a future that they know will get you there yes. and what I'm hearing you say is that maybe that's harder to do now than it used to be yes. maybe that was a maybe that was a good path when you only had you know doctor lawyer accountant but yes, now you've got doctor, yes. lawyer, accountant, you know, skinny yeah, yeah. candy options, and so it's much, much, even if your parents are, you have all the best intentions, it's very hard for them to actually figure out what your future should be for you. That's right. Yes, yeah. no, absolutely. And I do get terrified. Um, the idea of young children now wanting to be entrepreneurs at a very young age, and um, we did it. And I always, I mean, you know, my, 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 my dad died, so we had my mom, and my mother was actually very, very supportive because my mother is intuitively a risk taker and an adventurer. And my dad, much more conservative, so we always think, if only he knew what we ended up doing, that we both chucked our jobs as lawyer and investment banker, it would have probably killed him off anyway, yeah, that decision right. in itself. But yes, um, but you know, sometimes I think, I suppose, sort of, which is kind of what I believe as well, is that it's quite good at a young age to go and work somewhere and have a profession, learn work ethic, yeah. and then maybe later on, and then maybe parents have more confidence in their kids once they know they've done that and they've earned their stripes in a way. Mm -hmm. And I learned an awful lot um, being in the law firm with my brother um, at the investment bank. And I see people who have had a traditional um, career, I think, um, have learned a lot of disciplines that they can. Yeah, I was going to say discipline, I think, is yeah. true. It is true. It's, it's work ethic, it's a discipline that sometimes entrepreneurship is a bit the Wild West, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and those, those, those are tools that are, are very useful. That's very interesting because I think you're being very modest when you say, well, you start out and you learn and you go and next thing, you know, and you have this empire because most companies do either stay small or actually fail within the first two or three years. So there's something that you did that was different. There's something that you managed to do to get over that dangerous hump. Um, and would you attribute it to your training? Um, no, you know, what I actually attribute it to is the fact that um, uh, we just genuinely, we were our own customers. We loved the product. We'd done our research. We were out there seeing what's out there. Um, I was lucky that my partner was my brother who had the financial skills. So together we made the perfect entrepreneur. Um, I spend a lot of time judging a lot of business plan awards and entrepreneur awards. And you know, it's when you see why businesses fail, people often go into businesses where they just think it's a good idea. Someone said it's a good idea. They haven't really thought it through. They don't really know the market. You often find the reason why so many businesses fail. It's just this sort of, again, lack of thoroughness. Yes, it's a lack of thoroughness. They don't, they don't really know. They did, hadn't planned it properly. 
Interesting. How yeah. about building the business in terms of people? You know, we're a leadership and governance center, so we're always interested in the people aspect. Um, when you build a business much larger, it goes beyond your own dream and even beyond your own skills into finding people and sort of getting them up to speed so that they can do what you need them to do when you're not in the room, right? When you're not in the shop because you ended up with how many? Yeah, yeah, 110, 110 shops, yeah, yeah, right? Exactly. So any insights to share on that? Well, Kay, I think you've hit a big point for me because that's sort of currently um, what, I, what, what, what I do a lot of and kind of it sort of in a way goes, goes to my habits because um, I used to think, you know, companies start off small, they need the entrepreneur, and when you get big, you just need professionals to run the company. And in a way, that's... People who show up on time and do their job. Um, absolutely. Sort of, you know, kind of, exactly. People, managers, you know, whose professional job is managing. And they used to think, and that's how we felt at Coffee Republic. You know, we built it up. There was a lot of passion, a lot of out-of-the-box thinking. And when we got, became an adult, in a way, when the company became an adult, um, it sort of, we felt like, oh, now it needs almost adult supervision. So I'm fascinated by what you learned, in retrospect, um, growing uh, Coffee Republic, attempting to professionalize it, having it work to an extent, but then you came to a realization that maybe that's not the best way forward for a company. So can you talk more about that, this whole notion of innovation and entrepreneurship happening throughout the company? Yeah, so well, I think kind of, I suppose, you know, you, you really learn from your mistakes, and it was only once I left Gopher Republic that I realized the idea that we thought, oh, we're just the entrepreneur, and entrepreneurs are good for startups, and entrepreneurs don't actually belong to a company that grows up, um, how wrong that was, because the world's changed to such a kind of level now whereby every single company needs to behave much more like an entrepreneurial company, like much more like a startup, because even if you're a gigantic company, you still need the agility, the flexibility, the forward thinking. But, but what about alignment? Things. What about alignment? How do you make sure that those people who are being so entrepreneurial and creative aren't just heading off in the wrong direction? You see, I think it, it, there's this sort of misconception about, about people being entrepreneurial and creative, as in they are risk takers out there, taking bold risks. and. And for me, else. and ignoring everyone else, and yeah. you know, taking steering the company off in another direction, yeah. I, you know, for me, creativity is, is the everyday stuff. It's in the really mundane stuff. It's constantly reviewing what you're doing, seeing what the competitors are, empathizing with your customers, um, and seeing what's out there, and making sure you're ahead of the curve. Um, the way I learned this lesson was, you know, when we were small at Coffee Republic, we were a typical startup no head office, no hierarchy, no bureaucracy. We were out there with the customer. We were all our own customers. Each person had a pet store. They would go to a pet store every day. So you know, constantly people knew what was going on in the field. And it was out of the box thinking because we were new, so we didn't hire all those experienced people. We didn't hire people who knew. Probably, we couldn't right? afford people indus with industry experience. Right, right. So all we could afford was coffee drinkers, was you know, kind of fanatical coffee drinkers who were really obsessed with what we did and really believed in Coffee Republic. But as we got bigger, very, very gradually, we started attracting the CVs. Um, we brought people in from larger companies and they said oh well you know we need a structure and we, we know and of course there's a balance there because you can't run a company with a hundred bars you know out of a kitchen table so you do need certain structures and disciplines but sort of ways to keep track of things okay ways to keep track yeah. of things but that came at the expense of sort of it was like okay now suddenly and I remember when this new cohort came that we hired because we thought we needed them almost barriers went up around the desks, you know, okay, what's your title? Okay, that's your title, you focus on that area. I became marketing director, that was gonna be only my area, marketing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then the whole out of the box thinking goes, because you hire someone from Nestle and he spends his whole time telling you. He's got a thing he does. And that's, you know, they yeah. try that in Nestle, Nestle has commissioned huge money on that, believe me, that idea doesn't work. So, suddenly, and then very much so, suddenly the head office becomes very important. It all happens at the head office. You know, it's all about the meetings. It's all about and the people the down there don't feel as invested anymore because, frankly, they aren't. They are, and, and, and you're you physically know, they become be. far away because you're so yeah. busy in the head office that yeah. you don't have time to go out to the stores anymore. And I could see this happening, and I didn't quite realize what was going on. I was like, I'm in the store, and sometimes it was like, oh, why aren't you at the office? What are you doing? Well, it was really important to go and have a latte every morning mm -hmm. and see what was going on rather than read some market research report or yeah, some yeah, yeah. mysteries customer and and that's when I saw the, the difference between entrepreneurial culture versus corporate culture and it's really kind of once I left I realized that 
kind of what large companies are struggling now with this this idea of you know how to be innovative they have so many resources but it's just this lack of creativity which is basically ideas plus making it happen so what happens why why do people love corporatization so much why do people want to have the walls up in effect? Why do they enable the, the titles to take over? What's your theory? Uh, my theory of that is that it's been like that since the beginning, and it was fine in the 70s and kind of 80s because change wasn't that big. So as long as you set up, things were, you know, the status quo was pretty much the status quo, you know, throughout your whole career, and all you needed to do was just turn up, and the pace of change wasn't so much. So I just think it's actually a habit. And I think in large companies, because these things, structures have been set in stone in a way, um, they have become very rigid structures. Yeah. I think technology has made a big difference too, don't you think? Because now you can be out in the field and you can yes. be in connection where before you couldn't. Exactly you sort of had to choose. I'm either in headquarters where I'll be talking with my you know, peer group in the, in the different functions all the time, or I'll be out in the market. Exactly. And I'll be receiving orders, but I can't be both. And now you can be both. And because they don't realize that. It's an interesting yeah. way. There's a disconnect. They haven't caught up with technology, the, the way technology has. So, you know, in, in the same extent, I always say to people in big companies, listen, the same way that on a Sunday you still get work emails. It wasn't like that before. I mean, before you'd have to actually turn up at the office to get, you know, get a voicemail or hear, get a, sort of receive a fax. And now, because work has encroached so much on people's lives, there's no quid pro quo, whereas I think... It should be the reverse, and people should be allowed that flexibility and much more openness. And once you remove those old structures, I think people are inherently creative. It's just they have, and they want to believe, they want to engage, they want to be part of this work. But if you keep, if you keep, you know, counting their hours, and Absolutely. and 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 clocking them in and out, then they're going to respond in kind and say, well. Absolutely. If this is how you're counting me, then this is how I'm going to count you. Exactly. And then it exactly. becomes it's sort of an almost slightly antagonistic relationship between yeah. the individual and the work as opposed to, we know we have faith in you. We know you're doing your job. We know you're excited. You know, we're on, you know please stop working so hard exactly. <laughs> because, exactly. you're, because you're getting exactly. over-involved. If you have time to, you know, mew, have time to have your recording light on, get out there, have time to spend time with customers, you know, let's see how many meetings are necessary. So for me, it really is, and I think corporations are a huge need of that, and they feel the people in it feel, oh, I'm not the creative type. Entrepreneurs are different. So yeah. I spend a lot of time working within corporations saying, actually, you know, we are all the same. It's just that you've got these structures which are just like, literally stifling any creativity you have. Or you may have gone through a system that has, and this is a, something I hear about a lot in Asia, which is you've gone through a system that basically made you want, rewarded you for knowing a right answer, as opposed to rewarded you for pushing on an idea, or even challenging an idea, or coming up with a different idea. And so that's, it, it seems like the, uh, the challenge for people who've been through a system like that, wherever that may be, is that much greater because they've got to take more layers off of themselves That's in order right. to do that. So I'm really curious in your workshops, how do you do that? How do you, do you ever run into sort of some tough nuts that say, listen, I, I'm closed and you actually help open them? I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because I mean, the way I do it, and this is how I tackle creativity is, because um, there are these wonderful creativity books, but I'm sure people you know, but I kind of find they sort of sometimes complicated. And if you're, you know, it's it's an executive, it just, it's not, it's a, whereas for me, I just figured out, listen, and this is what I realized, listen, entrepreneurs, this is what we think about. These are a couple of stuff that we stick to. And if you think like that, then this will really help towards you becoming entrepreneurial. And again, I think it's about energy. It's just that you, you, you do, a f so one of them is, I, I can go through my habits, but, you know, becoming your customer, genuinely, you know, experiencing what they experience, not reading a market research report, being out there. Yeah seeing it, calling you. We're not so different from each other. Exactly. Whatever that person's experience, whatever you experience is what they experience. Okay, the other day I was in a room with someone and someone said, um, whoever's a customer, put your hands up, I'm a consumer. Do you know people, put, it was in a corporate environment, people didn't put their hands up. They didn't consider themselves consumers. It was really extraordinary. Wow. Whereas, you know, for, so, for, so the way I see it as entrepreneurs, it's really easy because all entrepreneurs start as customers themselves. You know, that's, yeah. that, that's all they look at. So. So that's a really obvious thing that changes energy hugely. And I even, I have this, I go to pharmaceutical companies, and a lot of them actually, they chose that job because of the drugs helping people's lives. But there's a disconnect. They've and forgotten they why they're there. They, they never even see that end result. They're there managing. That becomes what they do day to day. It's just their career versus, and so once people start engaging with the end. Yeah, that to me, the, the whole idea, that's a great example. 
why did I go work for a pharmaceutical company? Because I know they create products that save lives, you know, or, or, or improve the quality of life. To me, that implies a lot about what the role of the senior leader is to help people to stay connected to their own mission, to stay connected to why they joined. Do you have any ideas around that? I mean, wh what happens to the person at the top that, who probably also joined for the same reason, for all the yeah, best absolutely, reasons? Absolutely. What happens to that situation, that person at the top or that team at the top, where somehow they, they, they sort of forget, they, they fail to help people connect to their own best selves? That's right, yeah, yes. No, absolutely. No, interestingly, um, I just actually went to breakfast with um, Sir Terry Leahy of Tesco, kind of, I'm sure you come on. And he said something very interesting about market research. He said, by the time market research reaches the CEO's office, it becomes a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. You know, so in a way, so by so sanitized that, you know, it's not the real CEO story. Can't hear that, so yeah, so completely. Just, 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 you know, the that. first person that gets the market research changes around, and you know how it is exactly that by the time again. Absolutely. <laughs> that's exa and so, therefore, I think it's companies that are, you know, again, you know, it, it's, it's, I suppose, just a, a bit of a stereotype to mention a sort of Steve Jobs person, but when you read someone like that who was so close to the end product, um, you know, Howard Schultz of Starbucks, you know, why did he go back? Because, you know, he yeah. visited 26 stores a week when, when he was CEO and he's gone back to do that because for him it was all about what was going on, the theater, the hiss of the coffee making, the frothing of the machines. So it's about all CEOs n need to get back to that and, you know, we sort of fall in love with the, with the empire. It's not about that. I think everyone needs to get back to the customer mm -hmm. and which is what entrepreneurs do because there is no kind of empire there. It's just the customer. It's all you have really. Yeah, so that's my first one. My second one is get out. So that's the whole thing we we're discussing was you're not the reason why they don't see the customers. They're so busy having yeah. being busy. Real problem with priority. Exactly. And bureaucracy. Yeah. And that kills it. That whole presenteeism that actually still exists. Presenteeism? Yes. I mean, showing up is Showing up. Showing up. You know, <laughs> the jacket behind the yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of chair. That yeah. Make sure you clock in before yeah, a certain absolutely. hour. Make sure you clock out after. What happens in between or what you're doing at your desk? No. Yeah, and, and yeah. sometimes I go through, when I do my workshop, we go through uh, the kind of their, their weekly diaries, and often they have conference calls with people within the same office, like in the same building, you know how it is, and Should these are, the coffee. <laughs> I mean, they never kind of get out there, let's get out there, this is just a conference call is not where creativity happens, and yeah. they spend a lot of time reading reports and stuff, so this idea of entrepreneurs are out there because entrepreneurs don't have head offices, so they actually have to be out there because you often work from where you are, or... Do you see what I mean? Plus, you're just constantly figuring it out. That's the nature of an entrepreneur. You're constantly figuring it out. Exactly. So that's that. And kind of, and again, this whole idea of the royal visits that people do, you know, kind of, again, working with a beauty brand company, they said that sometimes when senior management go to see the setup in a, in a department store of the beauty brand, everyone knows. So everything's polished, almost freshly painted by the time they get there. Absolutely, yeah. and everyone knows, and they come like with a whole entourage, and you know, so that, that's and that's stuff entrepreneurs don't do. So I would use this all to real simple stuff for entrepreneurs because I think uh, my third one is the importance of being clueless, which is basically that's entrepreneurs are <laughs> entrepreneurs are clueless. So there is no dominant logic. There's no this is how we do things here. It's just you know you 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 you, you see stuff because you you're you're like a novice you know you're like a you look at it from the outside so you spot opportunities others miss, um, so that that is kind of a big point so this idea of unlearning, becoming a bit clueless, forgetting about what you always know I think I think is an important one. I think that's very important. I can see that, and yet I can also see that you do knew, you do know some things. And so the balancing act, is there a, is balance the right way to talk about it or is it an interplay? Well, it's an interplay, it's being aware. Yes, um, I mean, what I try to do, again, I'm not because you're trying, but, the, but what, I, what I try to do in my workshop is um, I have sort of limiting phrases versus clueless phrases. Mm -hmm. And some of the words that, and people are just, you know, as soon as you ask people, it just comes out, you know, oh, no, this is not how we do it. Oh, no, this is not the right time. Oh, no, this is not important oh, is now. Not this is how we do We're too busy now for this. Do you see what I mean? It just kind of, it's all these words that without realizing it become, that's the thing. Openness. And people yeah. say that, and people are often responsible themselves. They become aware. They say it a lot. So it's kind of, in a funny way, it's the language, it's the attitude of, you know, am I looking at this afresh or am I looking at this with all this baggage that I carry? Mm -hmm. And I really yeah, saw that. that and is my ego involved in whatever, however yes, I've done it before? Because I think that's a lot of what happens when you get these people in from company X and they join your organization and they, how do I imprint on here? How do I show my value? Bring something it's to all about exactly. their own insecurity around showing that they're valuable as opposed to saying, hey, you know what? I'm new here. Let me see what I Absolutely. can learn. Yes, yes yeah. completely. Yeah. Exactly. And, then that, and that's where you sort of, say, you know, a lot of, that's why they say, you know, everyone's reading the same diet of information. 
um, that their competitors are reading. You know, everyone reads the same market research reports. Yeah. Again, in the book today, we're saying they copy and paste. You know, it's the same thing. So this is the idea of actually, do you know what? It's like bad market research, actually. Yeah, but still, absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah, but, they, but they tend to do that. They're just sitting there and There is a lot of bad market again. research. Yeah. So this is about being an They're outsider. They're checking a box. Again, checking it's not passion. Yeah. It's not passion. It's saying, well, there's a process. The process includes this. It happens to be market research. OK, let's check that box. Exactly. But it's not deep curiosity. Exactly. It's not deep knowledge. And, and, and what's interesting about this, a deep curiosity is actually I mean, what's better for you as an individual, have deep curiosity, have passion, or tick the box. I'm ticking the box is very boring thing to do, and you turn into automaton when you tick the box. You know, whereas when you're exercising curiosity in the workplace, that's why entrepreneurs have so much fun and love it. Because that's what you're doing, you're exploring. And what I find actually often is um, people are very different how they are like at the barbecue at the weekend than they are in the, in the workplace. And applies quite a bit for men as well, I think. And so sometimes they don't bring those same skills of playfulness and that sort of thing to, to, to the workplace. So this is about you know removing everything they know, so my cluelessness. Um, my fourth habit is, um, uh, is uh, the notching up on nose, which is basically, yeah, and yes, notching up on nose, which is basically receiving a lot of nose. Okay. Uh, so what I mean by this is, you know, when we were at Coffee Republic, I mean, we got rejections from 40 bank managers. That's nothing because Howard Schultz of Starbucks got 278 right, bank managers. Exactly. So that's the idea that entrepreneurs often get no's in pursuit of their idea because innovation is really messy. Yeah. And no one's going to say, oh, my God, genius idea. This is yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People always reject ideas. But there's a lot of conservatism from everyone's part, and especially in big companies. So this is the idea that actually no one's going to say, yes, oh my god, that's such a brilliant idea. You're going to get a lot of resistance because new things are resisted. So you need to factor that in. I'm thinking back to when I was in, when I was in university and graduating, and of course everyone applies for jobs, right? And people get a lot of no's, and the way that they dealt with that, rather than get rejected, was to tape them up on their walls. You know, because they could make fun of the no. You could make fun of the no and just say, oh, I got another no today. You got to sort of take the power out of the no and Absolutely. not let it bother you. Absolutely. It's almost the word almost has to become meaningless. Exactly. You know, someone's opinion, frankly, because it's just it? someone's opinion and they it's don't know what you know. They don't know. They haven't got time. Maybe they had a bad day. They said yeah. no. Exactly. And yet this got a real stigma, I think, in companies. Yeah. Ooh, I went somewhere and said no. Oh, my God. Like, this, yeah. this is it. You know, I remember when I was at a law firm, it was just someone saying no to an idea was really, you were sort of struck down. So I think it's this, and this sort of attitude to, and that creates fear. And I think there's a lot of fear in organizations. And fear, I think, is the biggest um, block to creativity because Absolutely. fear makes us complacent. Fear and judgment. Yeah, judgment. Well, it's, it, judgment it makes you huge. very judgment worried. Yeah. yeah. So as the leader, and again, I'm, I'm drawing this back to, we recently considered, I told you before we got going here, we recently com completed a very large study of Asia, uh, Asian leadership. And one of the things that actually is no surprise, you didn't need a large study for this, was that it's often the culture in many Asian firms, in many Asian families, in many Asian countries, um, that there is a boss at the top who is very much uh, respected, and the form of respect is to not speak up. The, f the way the form that the res that the, that respect takes is to do what the boss says. And this is obviously a tough thing um, for a company that needs to be innovative because every company needs to be innovative these days. So uh, you know, maybe now or maybe later, you can give us some advice on either to this person or to this person on what needs to change in that relationship. Uh, it's probably both, actually, um, but. What advice would you have on the basis of your attempting to help people to become, or organizations to become more innovative? How can they get past that very entrenched dynamic yeah. that um, is actually, you know, centuries old? Yeah. Um, it's a, well, that's the kind of million-dollar question in a way. I suppose yeah. kind of what happens is presumably the, the, the leader on the top realizes that some sort of change needs to happen, right? I mean, that's the thing. I mean, if you're leader and you've really got your kind of head to the ground, you realize actually things are changing. Yeah. To th th this way is not going to work anymore. Yeah. Um, so then the question is, what do I need to change? So I think the leader needs to change their own behavior about how he release, they release sort of, you know, kind of people's creativity. And, you know, once it's released, the way I see it is, you know, I don't know much about company culture. All I know is about individual behavior. And once everyone buys into this idea that they need to behave differently and that it's actually fun to behave differently. And there's a bit of reward in it. And then there's <laughs> reward in it. And, and certainly no punishment. And exactly. <laughs> that sort of, that's why I just believe just slowly that's how you create kind of culture change for me as individuals. So 
you know, that's what I kind of working with small teams. And, you know, what I'm seeing in corporations, which is why me as an entrepreneur gets invited constantly to big corporations, is they, they need that. They Listen, we need these people. to. They're too stuck there. They hate change. And it, it's, it, it, that sort of stagnancy is not, it's not good for a company in this, in this crazy world we live in. So I think everyone's realizing how important that is, and it's becoming a bit of an imperative, I think, for everyone to change, they, everyone top down to, to change how they behave. Are there certain industries or certain parts of the world or certain uh, uh, types of companies that are getting this message more quickly? Are there certain, for example, are there industries that are being more affected by, say, technology change? Or, or are you just finding that there's sort of a general awakening? To yes, I think, yeah, it's a general yeah. awakening in their pools. And there are changes happening. You know, people are behaving differently. But it takes a long time because that old world corporate culture, you know, was there for a long time. So yeah. it, takes, it, it takes time to change direction. A, a, a big ship like that. And I think there's definitely, you know, one can always sort of celebrate the kind of those Silicon Valley startups and, you know, that's how they do it. But, you know, I think that change is happening in what you call the kind of bigger kind of companies. And it's just in little pockets. Um, it's just that they don't kind of, they haven't seen the results yet. And, and it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to put your finger on. But the fact that people are surviving means they're not behaving in the old way because I'm convinced the old way is just, just well, no company is going to survive if they behave that way. Fun. Yeah, and then young people. You see, if it's when it's less fun, you're not going to attract the, the young young people. Don't want to. Yeah. Well, you're certainly there. not going to attract people who want to be creative. Yeah. yeah, and young people, I think, presume you know, because of technology, the way their brain is wired, they're, the they're completely. I mean, they're not going to work for a company that treats them like that. So yeah. yes, it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. So uh, you know, uh, any words of wisdom? I mean, for uh, for for people who are trying to make that shift. Like say say we're say say. Uh, we're dealing with someone who they're at the top of the house they've had a more traditional kind of upbringing and they've had a more traditional kind of experience they get it intellectually that they need to make this shift but there's other things that need to happen inside of them to truly open up and feel comfortable with this to start talking to some people more on a first name basis um, to start really listening to new ideas and speaking last instead of first you know to truly keeping the door open in fact maybe moving the door so that it's not at this big office at one end of the um, you know one end of the building to you know more central location what kind of advice can you give to that person who's trying to make that shift and is hitting a bigger bigger barrier perhaps than yeah. they know and how and to and deal and with and this person you're thinking the, 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 the sort of leadership person right yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah you know I mean what I find is often because this is kind of who sort of often instructs me with the problem. You know, people, at the reason why they have got to the leadership position, because they do have passion for the product, which is how they made right. themselves there. That's or true. if they were, so they do have some, they have that special connection. But they realize it in themselves. They, they, they have it. Yeah. It's just that it's been suppressed. It's there. Yeah. But even for them, it's been suppressed. Even for them, they haven't got time to be out there with, with the customers anymore because they're, they're managing people. And people used to think manage, you're managing per se was all you did. Yeah. So I think even for people like that, that you know, they really are often get back in touch. Get back in touch, absolutely. And I recently sat on a very interesting board at an energy company. And it was I don't sit on boards because I don't like the way kind of boards operate. But it was called a consumer council. And so we had the CEO of the company we had the heads of all the departments, but we also had two of the girls in the call center at the mm -hmm. co-face. We had, I actually sat there as a customer. I became a customer of the energy company. And it was just, we were just discussing the real stuff with the CEO there, with the managers of the teams there, with the girls from the call center saying, yes, you know, this is the problem we've got. And a lot of real issues were discussed and the energy of the company changed. They made huge changes because real stuff was discussed in real yeah. time with people from the co-face. You know, whereas just this hierarchy doesn't work for anyone leader or the, 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 yeah. the person, you know, kind of way down. So I think it's about everyone reconnecting with why do they do this. Yeah, yeah. Are there any, um, I guess the last question, are there any industries that you've encountered where that's just not possible? No, not at all. I, you know, that's why when I sat on this energy company, I was like, yeah. oh, my God, that is so boring. You know, how could someone like me sit on utility energy? That's exactly. And yet it was one of the most interesting things I ever did because I just said, you know, everyone's got a consumer. That's a beauty. Everyone's got a customer. Everyone's got a consumer. And everybody yeah. needs energy. Yeah. Every, everybody needs energy. Everybody needs telecommunications. Everybody. Need, if you're making something that nobody wants or nobody needs, then you're not in business. Yes, absolutely. So by definition, if you're in business, there is some sort of deep need that you're actually 
meeting and you've just got to reconnect to that. Exactly. And often people who actually work there must have had some connection with that with that product. And so that's where you often find, you know, I think passion is a bit overused in a way. For me, passion is, you know, everyone's got some sort of connection to why they worked at whatever company it is. And it's all about is going back inside and finding what is that connection, what do you actually love doing and reconnecting. So once everyone works in their calling, in their flow, in their zone, I think everyone performs better and, and that's how you get energy change, culture change. That's great. Lovely. Well, I, I, I can feel your passion and your energy. I can see why you're so successful. I, I would love to talk to you more. Um, but I think we've come to the end of our meeting, unless there's anything else that you'd like to say. No, I've enjoyed it tremendously. Thank okay. You. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, this you. has been uh, Sahash, uh, Hashemi here from, uh, with us with the Leaders Room. And so I'd like to thank you very much for joining us here at ICLIF. Okay. And I wish you the best visit here in KL. Thank so you. thank you from the Leaders Room. It's a wrap. <laughs>